Arcanium is an incredibly solid deck builder roguelite that I think has been a little overlooked. There are a couple things holding it back from being a top tier roguelite card game, but it still has some fun new mechanics to offer to veterans of the genre. So let's get into it. Arcanium is a team based deck builder roguelite where you control a team of three heroes. At its core, the gameplay of Arcanium will feel familiar to roguelite card game veterans. It's turn based, you play cards on your turn in exchange for action points, and then the enemy moves on their turn with clearly telegraphed attacks and buffs. The most obvious distinguishing factor of Arcanium is the team based nature, similar to games like Gordian Quest or Trials of Fire. Each character has their own deck of cards, their own energy points, relics, hit points, etc. Between fights, you can flesh out each character by adding additional cards to their deck, upgrading existing cards, or giving characters relics with powerful passive abilities. Each character also has an active ability. For each action point a character uses, they gain one fury. Once that fury threshold is reached, each character can use their ultimate ability for some powerful effect. This was definitely a great additional gameplay element and allowed for some more planning and playing around with that ultimate ability, that timing, that just added some more strategy to the game. Arcanium also uses a side deck like Vault of the Void. Basically, when you gain an ability or card, you don't have to add it directly into a character's deck. Instead, you can store it in the side deck and add to that hero or character's deck at any point in the future between fights. Along similar lines, you can also take cards out of each character's deck between fights and put them into the side deck. I mostly use the side deck to just adjust my character's build type over time or slowly replace those starter cards with more powerful, better cards later on. This side deck just allows for more frequent and easier modification of your deck while still keeping that random quality where you can only use what cards you find on a given run. Unlike other tactical deck builders like Gordian Quest, the playing field for Arcadium is much more limited. Each character is put in one of three lanes. Positioning becomes important because most cards are limited on where they can target, where they can hit. Melee cards, for example, can only attack enemies in that specific lane that each character or hero is in, while range attack cards can also target adjacent lanes. Positioning also matters for taking damage and being targeted by attacks, and I often found myself shuffling around my characters in order to allow my tank character to tank stronger attacks. Moving characters around usually does cost an action point, but there are of course some cards that will offer movements with other effects as well, like dash attacks that attack enemies and move your character at the same time. Overall, this tactical element of the game was nice and fun to experiment with, but I probably wouldn't go so far as to call Arcanium a true tactical game. Before starting each run, you select your team of characters, and I found the characters usually fit one of three niches or play styles. There were pure damage characters, like the starting mage character, damage tank hybrid characters, and more pure support characters, including the incredibly powerful healing character that I'll talk about later on. You can technically create any combo of three characters that you want. You could do three damage DPS characters if you wanted to, but I found the best success when my team had one character from each of these three categories. I'll talk more about the variety of characters later on, but there are many different play styles and builds, and that's one of the bigger pros or selling points of this game for me. Between fights, you navigate a flexible overworld that allows you to choose what encounters you have next. The map uses a hex grid system, you navigate like a turn-based game. Whenever you move to a new tile for the first time, you gain one threat, and once you reach 30 threats, you can fight the final boss. Basically, you have 30 actions or encounters before the final boss, but it's not a strict 30. Namely, some actions or moves don't give you threat, and you have a couple turns after you reach 30 threat before you're actually forced to face those bosses. The map itself is split into three different areas. Each area has their own enemies you encounter, relics you can get as a reward, and other small rewards here and there that are area specific. Each area also has their own area boss you can fight, in addition to the true final boss that you fight in every run. More generally, in addition to basic enemy encounters, you also have elite enemies. These fights can take one of three styles. There's a survival mode, where your goal is to survive a certain number of turns, a breach mode where you have to kill enemies in a barrel that spawns after them, and finally, the standard or classical fights, where the goal is simple, just kill all three enemies that exist. There are also shard fights, which I would think of as mini bosses with better rewards. Outside of those, the overworld has standard merchants, random events, and shrines that give you passive buffs for your party. I initially really loved this overworld system, it gives you a lot of flexibility to plan out your run, 
which led to some fun strategizing and planning out what I wanted to do. Deciding which area to go into also has implications on what relics you find, which can be better for some heroes or certain team types. It also just felt very different than a lot of other games. But I also became somewhat disappointed with wasted potential. For starters, while there are important differences between enemies and different areas, I'm not sure they really felt different enough, and that made the whole map begin to blend together in my mind. I think one reason for this is how condition effects work, which is a problem that affects hero variety as well. While there are a couple different damage over time effects, three of them, burning, poison, and void, function exactly the same and are the stable conditions of enemies in those three areas. At the beginning of each turn, you, or the enemy, take damage based on the number of stacks you have of that condition, and then the number of stacks lowers by one. The only functional difference between these three conditions is the different icon or color. This made the enemy attacks feel more similar, and because your heroes can apply those same conditions, they made that variety of the heroes feel limited as well. And this is a real shame because they do have one condition called shock, which is much more unique and also a lot more fun to build craft with. Shock makes enemies take additional damage for each attack they receive. And because of that, Shock can synergize really well with builds that have multi-strike, which are cards that deal multiple hits for a single attack. It's made for some really fun build combos. These simple palette swapped condition effects, burning, poison, and void aren't the end of the world, but again, it's just wasted potential. These condition effects could have been more unique and allowed for some more fun gameplay. My second and bigger problem with the whole overworld came from learning good strategies. Because you have so much flexibility over what encounters you take, you can basically avoid the hard encounters until you've built up a good deck and abilities from the easy encounters. You're never forced into that hard fight early on that might end your run in other games. You can just avoid them. But you can still fight those elite enemies later on as many times as you want, get those good rewards, and take it into the final boss fight. This meant my runs basically turned into me clearing all the basic enemies, random events, merchants, quests, etc. on the map until I had a strong team with good decks. And then I would take my team and clear out all the elite enemies until time almost ran out. Finally, I would clear the mini bosses for the rewards before going on to the final boss. Once I realized that good strategy and that you're not forced to take hard fights early on, I feel like a lot of that openness and flexibility of the world was lost. I still think the overworld is good, but I found it less innovative and less creative than I initially hoped. It is worth noting here, there's a second game mode called Arena that you can play as well. It's a much more streamlined experience that basically eliminates the whole overworld. I don't have much to say about this game mode other than it's fine, and it does pretty much exactly what you expect. I prefer the main game mode over Arena because I still enjoyed that overworld, even though I felt it could have been better and had more potential than was actually realized. Let's close this section with some odds and ends, starting with the user interface. Overall, the UI of this game is fine, and it has a lot of the nice things you hope for in roguelike card games. For example, you can right-click on each of your cards for a tooltip that explains all their special effects, their buffs, conditions, etc., like how poison works if you were confused. But there are also some UI things here or there that just feel clunky and overall disrupt the flow of the game. For example, as I mentioned earlier, you can only modify your side deck between encounters. However, if you're awarded a card after a fight, you can add it directly to your main deck, but you can't make any other modifications to your main deck until you finish accepting all the rewards. So there's this weird moment where you can partially, but not fully, modify your character's deck, and that was really confusing to me when I first started playing. I would try to make additional changes, but the game wouldn't let me, and I didn't know what was happening. Another example is that it's pretty easy to misplay cards if you mean to cancel them instead. None of these problems with the controls or the UI were game breaking, and you do get used to them over time, but it is something that just makes the game feel a little worse to play and a little more janky. The final note I'll make here is on playing the game on Steam Deck. This game is Steam Deck verified and runs perfectly well on Steam Deck. However, it doesn't have a controller control scheme, which means that when you play on Steam Deck, it makes you use the trackpad as a substitute mouse. Honestly, I expected this control scheme to be terrible. In reality, it's really not that bad, but it's certainly not great either, and it's definitely worse than playing the game with native controller support. So this game is playable on Steam Deck, but I also didn't really enjoy playing it on Steam Deck. Now let's talk some about randomness and variety in Arcanium. One of the things I liked most about Arcanium was the variety of different heroes you can choose from and their different play styles that they have. While the heroes do usually fit those three niches that I talked about earlier, 
pure DPS, hybrid DPS tank, and pure support. There was still a lot of variety in how the different characters achieved those niches, those playstyles. Taking those pure DPS characters, for example, there were some classes that focused on applying condition effects, a class that focused on summoning minions for DPS, and a class that focused on self buffs in single hard hitting attacks. This meshed really great with the hybrid DPS tank variety, and there are a lot of explicit synergies, like a team of two minion master heroes that had cards and ultimate abilities that synergized together and led to some really fun and overpowered feeling combos. Of course, in addition to cross hero synergies, there are plenty of fun, powerful combos that can be self-contained within one hero's deck. Another great source of character variety is that each character has at least two main mechanics, sometimes three. For example, the archer hero focused on spamming range attacks and on applying poison. To fit these different playstyles, you can also choose between three different ultimate abilities for each character once you've unlocked them, each ultimate ability emphasizing different hero mechanics or synergies. Of course, not all of that hero variety is perfect. The most notable flaw for me came from the variety of characters that filled the support niche. There were, in general, just fewer support heroes. And importantly, I found that the Antelope healer character was by far the most powerful support character due to the healing ultimate ability that was really powerful, as well as the fact you can fill their deck with various healing cards and block cards. This character felt so overpowered compared to other characters that I eventually just stopped making teams that didn't have this Antelope character. I would breeze through higher difficulties with this antelope and struggle at normal mode without it. Some better balancing of these characters or just some more support characters in general would be a great thing to just allow for some more character variety and therefore better build variety and team variety. On that balancing note, there are also one or two characters that just felt really bad to play. I'm sure some of that was me not understanding those characters or not meshing with their playstyle, but regardless, there are some characters that I had no success with. The second comment I have here in regard to variety is more neutral. Every hero has two alignments or types, similar to Pokemon or something like that. For example, one hero might be nature and elemental, while another hero might be elemental and arcane. There are a good amount of character specific cards, but there are also a lot of cards that can be shared across characters of the same type. So for example, certain elemental cards can be shared by characters that have the elemental alignment. This can be cool because it allows you to shuffle powerful cards between different characters' decks as needed, and it also provides a nice nudge that gives you ideas for synergies between different heroes of the same alignment or elemental type. I was initially really worried about this because I thought a large number of cards would be shared across characters and make different heroes feel too similar to samey. But honestly, each character has so many unique cards in different playstyles that the characters never felt super similar and every character still feels unique. Overall, because you both control your starting team and what order you do encounters in on the minimap, the game is really not that RNG reliant. That RNG is still present, especially in rewards you find during each run, but it just doesn't feel like a super RNG heavy or randomness heavy game. Along similar lines, I think because you're playing as three different characters that each have their own decks, their own card pools, I never really felt screwed over by RNG in regards to what cards I drew or what enemy attacks certain enemies did during fights. This feeling is especially improved because the ultimate ability also doesn't rely on RNG. So one powerful element for each hero is not random at all, and you can plan around that if you know what you're doing. So if you hate that RNG reliance of more traditional card game roguelites, Arcanium can be a great alternative there. A lot of variety in this game is self-driven with what teams you choose, what areas you clear in what order, what bosses you fight, things like that. Now let's talk about the progression and replayability of Arcanium. As a whole, Arcanium has a pretty sizable amount of cross-run unlocks while avoiding pure vertical progression or cross-run upgrades that make you more powerful. I just talked a lot about the different characters in Arcanium and the teams you can make with them, so let's talk about that character progression first. There are 16 different characters in the game, but you only start with three characters unlocked. You unlock the rest of them by doing certain challenges. Most of these challenges involve completing certain things in each of the three areas of the overworld, like unlocking a character for being the final boss of each area. For the most part, I quite like this unlock system because it basically just encourages you to try all the content in the game, see all the areas, see all their bosses, and therefore get all of the heroes. But there are also two heroes that have really weird and very grindy unlock systems. They require you to buy a certain value of items in two specific shops within runs, 
and I didn't really use these shops during my run, so these characters felt very painfully slow to unlock. And it was just a really weird and unpleasant contrast to the other characters that you unlock super easily. Each hero or character also has character-specific unlocks as well. As you play each character, they gain experience and can level up to unlock new cards you can find on future runs and new ultimate abilities you can equip in using future runs as well. It's relatively quick to unlock cards for each individual character, but because there's so many different characters in the game, collectively, it takes a good amount of time to unlock every card for every character. Additionally, there's also an account-wide level that unlocks more abilities and cards as well. These are mostly the shared cards I talked about earlier. For example, elemental cards that all elemental characters can use, or great cards that can be used by any character in general. And this is a pretty standard unlock system. Most card game roguelites have a similar system for unlocking new cards that entails basically just playing the game as different characters and unlocking more cards for them. As is often the case, some of these later cards that you unlock are more powerful than some of the starting cards. But it's definitely not a game like Urban Cards where some of those later unlocks are busted or overpowered. It's mostly just more cards that add more variety, more build crafting, things like that. Arcanium also includes ascension-like difficulty levels for you to climb. Each new level adds a specific challenge or buff to enemies. For example, the first hard difficulty level adds increased damage to basic enemies, while the second level makes the bosses deal more damage as well. Most of these challenges just make things harder, but there are some unlocks that require you to change your strategy as well. For example, the third difficulty level adds specific damage type resistant to some enemies, and that requires you to play a little differently Think about your hero's damage types when you haven't had to do that before. Ultimately, this difficulty level system is good. I always enjoy climbing the difficulty levels in games like this, and adding specific modifiers to each level is a great way to add difficulty besides pure number buffs. It's nothing super innovative or crazy. I call it Ascension-like because this is basically the same as how Slay the Spire uses difficulty levels, but it's still very functional, and it's still fun to climb your way up. When I first booted up Arcanium, I was really excited for the story and narrative. The game starts with a grand, two or three minute long cutscene that sets the stage for the world and the game you're playing. It's a classic story of good versus evil and fighting against a corrupting, powerful, evil force. I wanted to know more and see how that story would unfold through my playthroughs. Unfortunately, that opening cutscene is also the peak, the apex of the story for Arcanium. The only other real story elements that exist come in the form of occasional quips here and there from your team, text blocks about each biome before you start, and a text box you can read after you beat the final boss. It's not the worst story I've seen in Roguelite, but it's definitely half-baked and it's definitely lacking. So what's my verdict on Arcanium? Overall, I enjoyed my time with the game, and I think it's a solid deck builder Roguelite. It shines with its character variety and team synergies. It brings a couple innovative ideas, like a unique overworld that allows you to customize how you approach each run and what encounters you do in what order. Unfortunately, Arcanium's also held back by what I would call wasted or unreached potential. Things here and there that prevent the good elements of the game from being truly amazing. That character variety is hurt by poor balance. That overworld is limited by how easy it is to optimize. Small UI elements here and there are annoying or frustrating. And ultimately, this game is just missing some X factor, or that something special to make it really stand out as a top deck builder roguelite. I would still recommend this game to fans of card game roguelites. There are some novel elements to explore. It does enough things well, and the team mechanics, the variety, those synergies there are just fun to experiment with and try to optimize. But if you're newer to deck builders or newer to roguelites, I would recommend checking out the great to the genre first, like Slay the Spire, Monster Train, and Vaults of the Void. Huge shout out to all of our channel members for helping support the channel. Please like this video to help me out in the algorithm, and thanks for watching.